According to globalpetrolprices.com, the average price of petrol differs across countries. In comparison, the prices are lower in poorer countries, but higher in richer countries, with the ex exception of uh, the United States, who subsidizes the rates for its citizens. However, there are common factors that determine the retail prices of petroleum products, crude oil price, refining cost and profits, distribution markets, and taxes. In other words, the laws of economics, demand and supply uh, also controls that market. To give an insight into this, a senior researcher and policy analyst at Budget, Mr. Enebi Okpalua, joins me via Zoom. Uh, Mr. Okpalua, good afternoon. It's good to have you on the program. Good afternoon, Tulu. Thanks for having me. I think I'd like to start with the fact that the price of oil, there's a dip today, uh, particularly with uh, Brent and uh, West Texas intermediate. Uh, it's kind of it's down today more than three, uh, three about three dollars. Yes, three dollars. Yes. Great. So, uh, what is your reaction uh, to this, or what do you think is responsible for this? All right. So uh, there are several factors that affect the uh, price of uh, crude oil uh, globally. Uh, first is the conventional uh, economics, basically production, uh, logistics, uh, extraction, things that are going into the actual um, production of crude oil. And then we have other factors that tend to affect the price, which speculators tend to ride upon. And these are largely events. Several events, developments can affect uh, the price of crude oil, certain economic and trends, demand, supply, uh, production, uh, natural disasters, wars. So there are several things that could affect uh, the price of crude oil. For example, in 2020, when uh, the COVID pandemic struck, oil price crashed. And then uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine, we had a response in the oil market as well. And just recently, as um, the crisis in the Middle East started between um, Israel and um, Hamas, uh, then we've seen a response in the oil markets again. So different events tend to affect the uh, international price of crude oil. Mm. So about crude oil production too, in this part of the world, analysts like you or experts like you uh, would say that uh, it's quite expensive. And the NNPC has been saying they would do a lot to make sure they bring down uh, production costs and all of that. Uh, where are we with regards to this? Okay, and I, let me let me basically start from um, let me say the foundation. So okay, please. When you are looking at um, um the price of crude uh, or the the price of um uh, refined petroleum, it starts from the price of crude oil, or all, all the way from extraction to transportation, production, refining, and then another set of logistics to the pumps, and then you have your pump price. Now, when it comes to um, extraction of crude oil, a lot of factors also affect it. The terrain uh, from which you are extracting can affect the price of crude oil. The policies that are in, in force at the location in the or in the country where you are producing from. So basically, it is a lot easier to extract um, crude oil from onshore fields than from offshore fields. Uh, then, and then some certain locations due to their geography, uh, even on land, it's easier for uh, companies to uh, extract the oil from those locations. For example, at the time Nigeria was producing $30 from offshore fields, in Saudi Arabia, on, uh, onshore fields were producing uh, at $6 per barrel. When Nigeria offshore fields were doing $30, so at $28, $30, while Onshore fuels in Nigeria are doing around fifteen dollars per barrel, so uh, the terrain tends to uh, affect the price. The geography tends to affect the uh, cost of production, and then we have other issues that uh, that that influence like risk. If you have security risk in your region, it tends to increase the price, and then your taxes that you lay upon the um, prices, your fiscal regime tends to affect the price of um, crude oil. Uh, production in your location. However, uh, what um, let's say um, oil firms look at is the te in terms of the cost of production versus the prevailing international oil price. And even from our onshore fields, if we are doing thirty dollars per barrel uh, compared to the international oil price today, it still um, looks um, profitable. 
if you look at um, 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 shale oil that is produced in the U.S., the cost of production sits somewhere around uh, 45 to 50 dollars per barrel. So uh, that is why anytime there is a dip in the oil markets globally, the shale oil is one of uh, the, one of the first group of um, um, products to uh, go up in markets. Right. Mm. Interesting background there. Uh, but, 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 uh, Mr. Falua, you noticed that recently there's uh, Moman members came out to say the depots are getting dry uh, because the landing cost of PMS, according to them, is hitting uh, high above the roof. Uh, and um, they are saying that this will not encourage them to bring in products uh, at the moment. And now I, I want to ask you, the NNPC has come out to say there is no under-recovery, they are not paying subsidy. Something is missing somewhere, please. How do you come in here? All right. I had a feeling this was going to end up here anyway. So, uh, <laughs> well, um, okay. Let me, let me continue. I'll, be, I'll be address this in a minute, but let me just continue uh, the um, unbundling the um, cost structure of... Um, Go ahead, please. Of, of, of so, after the extraction phase, there's the um, um, logistics phase, midstream, which has to do with transporting... Uh, the crude oil from its production site to where to be refined. And then that attracts additional costs. So we have a lot of factors that tend to add to the cost there. And then uh, when it gets to the refineries, there's the refining cost and then refining margins that gives um, profit to the refining cost, right? Now, when refiners get the crude, when you look, when you look at the uh, production cost for refiners, the largest component there is the cost of the crude oil, which is the, big, the biggest cost component in a reproduction cost for refined, for refined petroleum. After it's refined, if it's in a country where they have refineries, from the refinery gates, you now have maybe additional minor logistics that add maybe a few uh, cents or pennies or naira, if it depends on the country. And then that forms the pump price. But if it's, if the um, product would be used in a country uh, that where they don't use, they don't have refineries, basically in Nigeria, where we have to import, the product goes to another freight cost, uh, shipping cost from for example, Northwest, Northwest Europe, where we import um, petroleum products from, it uh, incurs another freight cost all the way to Nigeria. And then when you get to Nigeria, you have additional costs like jetty costs, uh, financing costs, um, NEMASA costs, uh, Nigerian Port Authority costs, storage costs. Those also had another um, layer of cost to the, to, the, to the price of petrol. Now, all of this put together forms the landing cost of petrol in Nigeria. That is what it takes to get the cost, the petroleum to our shores from extraction, refining, freight to our shores. That's what makes the landing cost of petrol. Now, uh, because we don't refine, we, we lose out on the later part of that uh, value chain that allows us to control the cost from the refinery gates or from, um, from yes, from the refineries to the pump. That being said, uh, uh, I, I can't really uh, confirm <laughs> the stock in, in the depots. I, I, I would say the, the oil marketers had no why they say what they say, but uh, looking at um, the uh, major importer of petroleum in Nigeria, which is the NNPC, they have been the one importing petrol since 2016, and they've been the one in charge of distribution. And if the NNPC says that uh, that is not the case, that they have up to 30 days supply of petrol in their in their stock. I I I think unless someone else can provide uh, a different um, practice or proof of a different situation, mm -hmm. then we may just have to take their word for it. According to the NAPC, what they claim might be issues regarding supply it has to do with logistics in moving the product from the southern part of the country to the northern part of the country. At least that's what I read in the news uh, that the uh, head of the NAPC all said. But that, that is just the situation. Right now, the NAPC it tells us what their own price of uh, petroleum is going to be. So when do you think that marketers, I mean major marketers now, when do you think they can start to play fully in this market? I mean, active participation, bringing in products, um, you know, uh, because the FX issue is, uh, is on one side, uh, which is also yes. very important. Uh, so when do you yes. see us uh, getting to that point? I, 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 honestly speaking, 
I I don't I don't know. Wow. So until we resolve um the forex issues, uh now remember when I unbundled the cost structure, a lot of it is in dollars. Up until it gets to our shores is in dollars. It is now when we now want to factor in um the cost storage charge and that we might now begin to look at the naira equivalent, but there it is in dollars. And if the biggest component of your cost of production is in dollars, then your exchange rate has a significant impact on what you are going to be uh, paying for that product. Now, the exchange rate regime has been liberalized and you are free to source um, for foreign exchange where you can, but it's not, it's not that easy. If you are going through the INE window, you are going to be assessing it at, uh, I think currently at 770, mm -hmm. or at least the federal government maintains 770 to a dollar. But if you are not going, if you don't have, a, if you cannot source from there, then you are looking at more than nine hundred naira to a dollar, and that doesn't that just places your bottom line in rings. You, you can't do business like that. So uh, until there is a way we can manage our foreign exchange um, market system that is much more stable and um, conducive for business, I I don't know if uh, our oil marketers will be able to. Um, play fully in, in the downstream sector. Okay. You, you know, when we talk uh, oil production, refining is always key and it's something that we must touch on. We expect the NNPC, according to the NNPC, that the Port Harcourt refinery might or should come on stream by end of the year. Dangote refinery that we've all been talking about, I, I see a little bit of pause with regards to that now. Everyone is just taking their time to see what is playing out and to know when, which, when, what will come on board. Yes, I see the smile already on you, but but I'm looking at <laughs> refining. What what is running through you with regards to refining? And if we start to refine in country, what really are the positives? All right. So in in, in refining domestic refining of petroleum is will would help. It will help. It depends on how we. We'll, I don't know how much time we have, but there will. There will. If you want to have a, an appreciable difference with the current price today, as it uh, obtains in the market at the pump, then there will need to be some form of influence or intervention at the federal government level. Let me just leave it at that point. But refining is key to having a, a more control over your downstream sector. When you don't refine, you expose yourself to volatilities, not just in the crude oil market, but also in the downstream industry in the countries where you are importing petroleum from. So if any issues, if there is if there are riots in Northwest Europe that affects uh, logistics or or if there is if there are weather situations that causes um transport um shipping to be delayed, or if there are issues in the Suez Canal or the Strait of Hormuz. These things can compound and add to your cost. But if you refine, if we refine in Nigeria, we have the crude here, we can supply our refineries. So we, are, we shield ourselves from other externalities. That is one. Secondly, we can um, deploy some additional fiscal instruments to tweak the cost of production or the price of crude for refiners so that uh, the, the, the end price is a bit lower for Nigerians, in quotes. Uh, so refining is is key. You you can you cannot um you, you can't run away from it if you want to have a a, a good uh let's say fair price of uh, petrol in your country. Uh, you need that. Uh, for regarding the Port Harcourt refinery, the first phase is expected to be completed. Uh, hopefully, all things being equal, by the end of the year or first quarter of next year, that should unlock some four million liters of Petrol per day if it is operating at full capacity and if it's operating profitably. By the time the phase two is um, completed, we might push that to somewhere close to 10 million uh, liters of petrol a day. That could help. With the Dangote refinery, when that comes online, whenever it does, we can do maybe between 35 to 40 million liters of petrol a day. Add that, we are looking at some 45 to 50 million liters of petrol a day. Now, if you compare that with the current consumption level, of petrol in the country, for subsidy that has dropped. Before subsidy was removed, we're consuming somewhere an average of 68 million liters, at least between January and May. Uh, for subsidy that has dropped to somewhere 
around um, 48 million liters. At least if you take the average of consumption between um, June and July, you see, you're looking at 48. So we have a 20 million liters drop for subsidy. So com com combine, uh, compare that with, uh, with the Dangote refinery and then uh, the Portaco refinery. There is a possibility that if, that is if these are working optimally and their entire production goes into the country, that there might be, just based by, on the numbers, there's a possibility that we may begin to see some um, supply for domestic markets. Now, the issue is when will these refineries come online? Uh, that is the best person to answer that question is the NNPC and the um, leadership of the Dangote refinery. They've promised us somewhere between this last quarter of this year and first quarter of next year. Uh, let's hope the deadline is not moved, or moved backwards again. Well, let's um, look at the global issues now that we face, uh, and, and it's really affecting the price of crude, like we identified earlier. Considering all of this and what has happened, even regards to gas during the, Ru the Russian-Ukraine crisis is still on, too, and we saw what it played out in, in that space. What is your outlook for the entire space? Now, I'm, not, uh, I'm giving you en enough time. Now, not just domestic, even the global front. What is your outlook for the oil market? All right. Uh, apart from the fact the issues going on in Ukraine, Russia, and the Middle East, uh, a lot of other factors play when it comes to domestic uh, to, to global gas consumption. Uh, internationally, gas is um, projected to gas consumption is projected to increase at least over the next twenty years. And if you're looking at uh, if uh, from an investor's perspective, that is the lucrative part, the lucrative area for investment. All right. If demand is going to go up. Then obviously you have the markets that can um, accommodate your investments. Uh, it's not as easy, but it, it, I think for people or countries who already have gas, in, extensive gas infrastructure in place, they stand uh, in a better position to gain from the gas markets going forward. And for people who would like to plug into uh, these uh, markets, into the gas markets globally, then you have to factor in a lot of things. One of the drivers for gas consumption is uh, energy transition. So a lot of um, countries are now um, reducing coal use for power supply. They are transitioning to much more cleaner fuels. Some are using gas as an intermediate or a transition fuel, right? So countries like Nigeria, that is the policy that we wish to adopt. China, some countries in Asia, China, and I think Southeast Asia also probably doing the same thing. So definitely the market for, for gas is there. However, the competition is high. Right? In Nigeria, you have, you have to ship your products from Nigeria in, or in gas tankers, LG tankers from Nigeria across the Atlantic. Uh, if you are going um, to Europe, if you are going to China, you are now going around. You have to go ship from the bottom of Africa, around South Africa, and then all the way to Asia. That is the route that our energy tankers have to go through if we are going to supply China or Asia, or if we are going to supply Europe or the Americas. Now, there are a lot of competitors. It is cheaper to buy gas from Algeria than to buy from Nigeria. It is also cheaper to transport the gas using pipelines. And that is the idea behind the trans saharan pipeline where you cannot take gas from Nigeria's, Nigeria across the Sahara all the way to Northern Africa and, and meet demand in Europe. Uh, there, there, are, there aren't any pipelines that are run um, naturally across Africa from Nigeria to East Africa. So basically we're going to be competing with those in, at the, on the East African coast that, have, that are now beginning to discover gas supplies with countries like Mozambique who have discovered gas reserves and now are looking to develop their gas resources. Countries like Uganda that have discovered oil and are looking to discover and develop their oil and gas industry. So there, there's a lot of competition regarding um, the gas markets. So uh, it's, the, the market is there, but competition is high. Therefore, as a country, we need to look at our fiscal regime, make it quite competitive enough uh, to give us, to attract um, investors, but also make it, um, in the, make it good enough for us to extract the best benefits for the country and for Nigerians. And that, that is where I see the gas markets going globally. And if you look domestically, uh, yes, the market is at least for LPG 
LPG the market exists for LNG when you look at industrial processes and um and um for power generation the market exists but uh the the other issues you have to look at you're looking at uh the producers the companies who are producing it in Nigeria what what is their policy are they pulling out of the market in the next ten to twenty years that is going to affect your capacity to produce domestically and even supply your domestic markets so that that is where I see the gas market is going. Interesting right. conversation with you as usual, Mr. Enebi Opaluwa is a senior research and policy analyst with Budget Nigeria. Thank you so much and do enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much, David.